Today, our delegations discuss the tough issues that still remain to be resolved, including plans for disarming and demobilizing the FARC and measures to assure accountability for wartime atrocities. The outlook is promising, but the stakes are much too high to take anything for granted, and we don't. No one is in a celebratory status. There's work to be done. We're here to renew the commitment for these months uh, in order to complete the task. Having gone to war myself, I can tell you I know what it means that in peacetime, children are supposed to bury their parents, but in wartime, obviously, parents bury their children. Colombia has known too many generations of parents burying their children. In looking ahead, we have to remember that the key to Plan Colombia's success was always its comprehensive vision of how security is established and a commitment to stay the course until the job is done. Peace has to be built on a solid foundation, always, anywhere. And improvements in maintaining law and order are only a beginning. In addition, with support from the United States, Colombians have been moving ahead on a multiple of fronts in order to improve governance, strengthen the rule of law, build a more inclusive economy, extend protections to journalists and to civil society. Just as important, the government came to terms with the fact that terrible human rights abuses were committed solely by, not solely, by rebel groups but also by government and paramilitary forces. And those abuses also have to end and be accountable. Mr. President, as Defense Minister, you helped to address a dark chapter of this conflict, that of the false positives. And today, we welcome your commitment to forging a peace agreement that ensures meaningful justice for those and other crimes. For the United States, Plan Colombia required an investment of funds over some 15 years, an unusual degree of perseverance by our government on a bipartisan basis. But we would never have made that investment if the Colombian people and government had not made an even greater commitment and been willing to devote their resources and their energies to it. While the United States provided some $10 billion for Plan Colombia, that was less than 5 percent of the total. The success of Plan Colombia may well serve as a model for other countries in and beyond our hemisphere. But even as the day of a potential peace agreement may be drawing near, we are not about to be complacent. We believe the same comprehensive approach that brought Colombia this far is needed for the country to sustain its impressive progress and to capitalize on the benefits of peace. That is why yesterday President Obama announced that we will collaborate on the successor strategy to Plan Colombia. And that strategy, which we are calling Peace Colombia, Paz Colombia, will support the Colombian government's efforts to provide security and economic opportunities in areas that are vacated by FARC, areas uh, that require also the delivery of justice and help us to intensify the fight against trafficking in illegal drugs. As with Plan Colombia, Colombians themselves have agreed to take on the largest portion of this cost. But unique U.S. capabilities can help Colombia to win the peace, and we are determined to do that. In addition, the United States and Norway have launched a global demining initiative to help Colombia rid itself of these deadly devices by the year 2021. And together, we will commit an initial $50 million toward the initiative. I was just recently in both uh, in uh, Cambodia and Laos, where the detritus of the war that we were engaged in in Vietnam is still maiming people and taking lives, where we are still working on demining and on unexploded ordnance. 
So we understand this challenge, and it's one of the reasons that we are particularly committed and proud to be joining uh, with Norway in this initiative. It is critical to save lives, literally, and open the door to greater rural development. And today I can share with you that we have already received commitments to participate from the EU and 11 countries, including Argentina, Canada, Chile, Japan, Mexico, Slovenia, South Korea, Spain, Sweden, the United Kingdom, and Uruguay. Mr. President, you know better than anyone that the challenges ahead for your colleagues and you are obviously substantial. But with courage and determination, a just and lasting peace can be achieved. I know you understand that, and the prospects for Colombia can continue to grow brighter and brighter. The great Colombian writer, Alvaro Mutis, wrote that life always holds in store more surprises that are more complex and unforeseeable than any dream. La vida siempre depara sorpresas que son más complejas e imprevisibles que cualquier sueño. Colombians now have good and tangible reasons to dream for a future that is more peaceful and prosperous than at any point in the last half century. In the effort to make that dream a reality, have no doubt that the United States of America will continue to stand with Colombia as a partner and a friend. I thank the President for his visit here, which has been, we think, uh, warm and, and, and really exceptional. Uh, and it's because we are in common cause for peace. I'm pleased to yield the floor to our distinguished guest, President Santos. Thank you. Bueno, muy buenas tardes. Eh, primero, agradecerle al secretario Kerry y a todo su equipo su hospitalidad, la forma como nos han recibido aquí en el Departamento de Estado. Tuvimos una reunión muy interesante y muy importante. Después del anuncio ayer del presidente Obama de iniciar un nuevo capítulo en nuestras relaciones, Cerramos el capítulo del Plan Colombia y abrimos el capítulo de Paz Colombia. En esta reunión lo que hicimos fue aterrizar esa iniciativa donde vamos a concentrar los esfuerzos, identificar las prioridades. Identificamos prioridades como la de continuar el elemento de seguridad y la lucha contra el narcotráfico, sobre todo la lucha contra el crimen organizado para evitar que el vacío que van a dejar las FARC lo llene ese crimen organizado y luchar de la mano contra el narcotráfico y el crimen organizado en otros países en la región. Ya hemos comenzado y hay un gran potencial de cooperación mutua para beneficio mutuo. El otro tema que identificamos fue el de la implementación, la parte operativa, la parte logística de los acuerdos. Ahí necesitamos ayuda y Estados Unidos tiene una gran experiencia, un gran conocimiento en estos aspectos. Un tercer tema muy importante es el tema que tiene que ver con el desarrollo rural qué vamos a hacer en las zonas de conflicto, los proyectos productivos, llevar a esas zonas la presencia del Estado, fortalecer la justicia, construir vías terciarias, llevar colegios, llevar hospitales a regiones que por razón de la presencia del conflicto habían tenido un total abandono, el Estado no estaba presente. Y el cuarto punto lo mencionó el secretario, es todo este proceso de desminado. Colombia, después de Afganistán, es el segundo país más minado del mundo. Un esfuerzo enorme y el objetivo es muy ambicioso. De aquí al año 2021, erradicar las minas de Colombia. Eso se requiere un, un gran esfuerzo. Nuevamente, muchas gracias. Secretario Kerry, muchas gracias al gobierno norteamericano 
y a los gobiernos como el de Noruega que han estado interesados y que ya están eh, comprometiéndose con recursos eh, reales en este proceso de desminado. El posconflicto tiene unos retos enormes, pero también ofrece unas oportunidades enormes. El país va a vivir otra vida, una vida mucho más placentera, donde vamos a dejar a un lado el miedo, el miedo de vivir en guerra, que infortunadamente hemos tenido durante más de 50 años. Hace 15 años nadie se imaginaba que hoy podíamos dar los resultados que el mundo entero está admirando. Tuvimos una reunión muy parecida eh, a la que tuvimos hace 15 años hoy y les recordaba cómo los dos gabinetes estaban sentados al frente proyectando 15 años que se cumplen este año y que hoy podemos decir todos que se cumplió con creces el propósito del Plan Colombia y que esperamos que en 15 años nos, nos volvamos a reunir y poder decir que el propósito de Paz Colombia también se cumplió. Esa ayuda mutua, ese trabajo en cooperación con Estados Unidos ha dado grandes resultados, es nuestro socio estratégico, nuestro primer socio comercial, el primer inversionista en el país y por eso eh, valoramos tanto eh, la ayuda y la cooperación que hemos recibido y que seguiremos recibiendo. Hay un verdadero compromiso, ya no, como ahí se dijo, de trabajar por Colombia, sino trabajar con Colombia para bien de nuestro país y para bien de la región. Ya se termina esta visita de tres días. Yo creo que la visita más fructífera, más provechosa que hemos tenido en los últimos tiempos. Le mencionaba al secretario Kerry que yo vengo acompañando presidentes en este tipo de visitas desde hace 25 años, con el presidente Gaviria, después con el presidente Pastrana, luego con el presidente Uribe. Nunca, nunca hemos tenido una visita tan constructiva, tan provechosa como la que hemos tenido el día de hoy, el día de ayer y el día de antes de ayer. No solamente nos hemos reunido con el gobierno, también tuvimos reuniones con los máximos representantes de los dos partidos. Parte del éxito de la ayuda que hemos recibido de Estados Unidos se debe a que ha sido una política bipartidista y tuvimos la oportunidad de entrevistarnos tanto con las directivas en el Congreso del Partido Demócrata como del Partido Republicano. Y nos vamos muy optimistas que se va, que va a continuar esta actitud, este enfoque bipartidista, apoyo de los dos partidos y eso es prenda de garantía del Paz Colombia hacia el futuro. Es una visita que nos llena de satisfacción, nos llena de orgullo, eh, porque los colombianos tenemos que comenzar a creer más en nosotros mismos. Al igual que nuestros aliados, nuestros amigos creen en nosotros por razones objetivas, nosotros mismos debemos creer más en nosotros para poder ir despejando ese mejor futuro que vamos a, ten, a tener una vez firmemos la paz. La paz va a ser... Eh, una oportunidad de oro para que el pueblo colombiano se una, se ponga nuevamente unos objetivos muy ambiciosos y como nación, unidos, sigamos persiguiendo esos objetivos que se pusieron eh, los padres de la patria aquí en Estados Unidos. Benjamin Franklin, estábamos en un salón donde estaba la estatua de Thomas Jefferson, los mismos objetivos de buscar la paz, la felicidad, la justicia, que se pusieron también nuestros padres de la patria. Así seguiremos progresando juntos eh, con una visión compartida, con unos objetivos comunes y así es como se logran los grandes cambios para bien de nuestras dos naciones. Muchas gracias.
Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. We will now take uh, two questions, one from each side. The first question will come from Leslie Routon from Reuters. Thank you. Um, Mr. Secretary, good morning. It was a little afternoon by now. Um, what can you do before the Munich meeting next week um, to keep the Syria peace uh, talks from totally collapsing? You've come under criticism that you're believing the Russians too much over opposition uh, who you convinced to go to the peace talks, yet the Russians bombed, was bombing the very parties at the table. Is Russia pretending to pursue diplomacy while actually seeking a military uh, solution? Um, President Santos, um, what new assurances did you receive from the Republicans you met yesterday uh, that they will get you the money that President Obama um, has asked for? Also, this peacetime uh, opportunity um, that you refer to has come at, the, at um, a time of very low commodity prices. Is there any um, effort by the Colombian government to perhaps seek additional financing facilities from uh, the World Bank to help you get through this? So, um, first of all, let me just say <clears throat> that uh, neither Russia nor Assad nor the supporters of Assad are at this moment in compliance with the United Nations Resolution 2254 that they voted for, that at least Russia voted for. Obviously, Assad didn't have a vote. That resolution calls for, in December, on the 18th of December, called for immediate access for humanitarian assistance to all Syrians in all parts of the country. Neither the Assad regime nor the supporters have made that happen. Secondly, it also calls for an end to all aerial bombardment and all artillery, bombardment of civilians, and that should have ended according to the United Nations resolution that Russia voted for, and it hasn't. Moreover, there is evidence that is clear that Russia is using what are called free-fall bombs, dumb bombs as they are known. They're not precision bombs. And there are civilians, including women and children, being killed in large numbers as a consequence. Hospitals have been hit. Uh, civilian uh, quarters have been hit, and in some cases, after the bombing has taken place, when the workers have gone in to try to pull out the wounded, the bombers come back and they kill the people who are pulling out the wounded. This has to stop. Nobody has any question about that. But it's not going to stop just by whining about it. It's not going to stop by walking away from the table or not engaging. You have to have a negotiation to arrive at the modalities of all parties complying and providing the access and providing for a ceasefire. Now, the next days will tell the story of whether or not people are serious or people are not serious. We are engaged right now, as I talk, yesterday, in direct discussions in order to determine whether or not access could be quickly provided a number of modalities for providing that humanitarian access are being discussed, and the modalities of a ceasefire itself are also being discussed, and the Russians have made some constructive ideas about how a ceasefire, in fact, could be implemented. But if it's just talk for the sake of talk in order to continue the bombing, nobody's going to accept that. And we will know that in the course of the next days. As you know, the parties met in Geneva. The parties came to the table. The, 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 under the UN auspices, we are not at the table, but we obviously are following it closely and are engaged with the opposition and with uh, the other members of the International Syria Support Group, which includes 
Russia and Iran and others. And so we are pushing in the direction of trying to get the full implementation of Resolution 2254. Now, these talks uh, have not, uh, quote, failed or stopped. They have interrupted at the, at the judgment of the UN envoy who made the decision to suspend them while the modalities of the access of humanitarian assistance and potential CFIRE are worked out. And that makes sense, particularly since we have a meeting scheduled in Munich on the 11th in a few days where the entire International Syria Support Group will come in order to see whether or not these parties are serious. So as I said, we will know in the next few days who is serious and who is not. And that has always been the intention of the diplomatic process. The diplomatic process has to use the tools that are at its disposal. You know, diplomacy is the opposite of uh, the actual pointing of a rifle and the pulling of a trigger. It is the effort to come to an agreement uh, and to find a way forward that ends the pointing of the rifle and the pulling of the trigger. And that is precisely what we are engaged in right now. Uh, I believe that uh, over the course of the next few days, we will know the answer to the question you've asked, whether or not it's an effort to delay. If it's an effort to delay, the talks will not go forward. If it's an effort simply to game the process, then as I have said from day one, it will not end. The war will not end under those circumstances. And when I was in Russia, I said very directly to President Putin, in the next month or two, you and others who support Mr. Assad are going to have to make some very fundamental decisions about the way forward. Because if all you're trying to do is leave Assad in place, the war will not end. And there will be more terrorists created, more violence, and it will be even harder to hold Syria whole and united as a single country. So that's our mission. That's the purpose of these talks. And uh, as I say, uh, we will have a much better sense in the next few days of how serious each party is. Uh, Russia has indicated to me very directly they are prepared to do a ceasefire. The Iranians confirmed in London just a day and a half ago they will support a ceasefire now. We now have to have all the other members of this, all the other parties come to the table and acknowledge that they too are prepared to do that. And as of this moment, we don't have that full acknowledgement. Regarding, I had the opportunity to meet uh, with uh, the leaders of the Republican Party, both in the House and the Senate. I expect I spoke to the Speaker, Speaker Ryan, and the chairs of the different committees in the House. The same thing with the Senate leader and the chair of the different committees, and other members of Congress from the Republican Party and also from the Democrats. But from the Republicans, I did not hear one single voice that uh, put in doubt the enormous success of Plan Colombia. And one of the reasons that always emerged in the discussions of this success <clears throat> is that it was a bipartisan effort. And uh, many even mentioned uh, it's a very high return on your investment. Uh, what we see now, and uh, compared to what we had 15 years ago, you can see the change, the dramatic change for the better. And what I received was expressions of continuing support. I did not mention, I, had, I did not know uh, the exact numbers of how much the uh, past Colombia will contemplate, how much President Obama and the government is going to ask Congress. Um, we heard this figure yesterday over $450 million. Um, and uh, I hope that uh, the U.S. Congress supports the government because uh, this is an effort, a bipartisan effort, that has been extremely successful. 
good for the United States, good for Colombia, and good for the whole region. And don't forget that Colombia uh, bears the lion's share of the cost. 95% of the effort was financed by Colombians. On the second question, uh, we are, have been adapting ourselves to a new reality. The price of oil has hit us hard. We depended 20% of our total revenues from the oil sector. For this year, we have budgeted zero. Um, but the, the adaptation to this new reality has been done in a well-planned manner. We have been pragmatic. We call this intelligent austerity because we're doing it in a way that will allow us to maintain our fiscal policies, our fiscal responsibility, but without affecting too much growth and especially the most vulnerable sectors of society. That we have, we have been doing, uh, and that's why we are leaders in growth in the whole of Latin America. Last year, we were number one, not only in economic growth, but also in the reduction of, of uh, unemployment, in the reduction of poverty, and in the increase and strengthening of the middle class. This year, we think we can repeat that because we have put in place the largest uh, investment in our history in infrastructure, which is already uh, going on. Uh, the housing projects that have already put in place will, uh, will stimulate the economy uh, very much, and we hope to grow uh, around 3% this year also. Uh, and in terms of needing more finance, we have ample room in terms of access to markets, financing, because of the way we have been adjusting ourselves to this new reality. Fiscal responsibility, confidence of the markets in the Colombian economy is a priority, <clears throat> will be a priority, and we will maintain these policies in order to sort of weather the storm uh, and maintain our course in the correct direction. Our second and final question today will come from Michael Buitrago from Red Moss Noticias. Buenas tardes, Secretario John Kerry, Presidente Juan Manuel Santos. En primer lugar, Presidente... Good afternoon, Secretary Kerry, President Santos. President Santos, what conditions have uh, been put by President Obama for Paz Colombia and what guarantees have you offered, or have you been offered because we know that there's a new government coming and we've heard criticisms from Republicans to the Paz Colombia. Secretary Kerry, we would like to ask you what commitments and conditions will be imposed by the U.S. government to the FARC given their request that they be taken away from the list of uh, the um, terrorist groups and also the extradition? I will answer your two questions, the two questions you asked me. <coughs> conditions of President Obama's uh, government to Colombia, no conditions. This is a cooperation between two countries that are friends that are seeking common benefits. If things are, go well for Colombia, they'll go well for the U.S. If the objectives that we want to reach are attained, both countries and the region as a whole will, be, will benefit. Peace in Colombia is not just the peace for one country, it's peace for the region. This is the last armed conflict in the whole of the Western Hemisphere. It's the oldest, one of the most cruel. And to end this conflict will be a success, a victory for the whole world. So the enormous support we've had, not only from the U.S., but from the world as a whole. What happened in the U.N. last week and I've already expressed my gratitude to Secretary Kerry, who was there 
We had some uh, Ambassador Samantha Powers in the meeting, and the U.S. supported the U.N. resolution that we, was unanimously approved. And that is very significant because it represents the support of the world to the peace in Colombia and to the plan past Colombia. Now, guarantees in terms of continuity uh, of the support of the Republican Party, I will answer the same thing that I answered the prior question. What I received from the Republicans was a recognition and a unanimous acknowledgement of the success of Plan Colombia and their will to continue supporting it. This was the most successful uh, bipartisan foreign policy initiative of the U.S. in the last few years. And what I received, no formal commitment, of course, because that was not the case, but uh, I received a commitment to continued support. Of course, in all processes, there are people who are not in favor of one thing or another. Peace processes never, by definition, are perfect. They cannot be perfect. And there will always be some people who will be against them. It's normal here, it's normal in Colombia, it's normal in the world as a whole. But what I have perceived here in the U.S. is an enormous support from the majority of the Americans from members of Congress who have supported this peace process in Colombia, because peace in Colombia means peace for the region. So let me uh, reinforce what President Santos has said. Uh, there are no conditions. Uh, we have reached no agreement of any condition whatsoever. Uh, there's been no discussion of that. Uh, the United States and Colombia enjoy a very uh, robust, outstanding law enforcement relationship and an extradition relationship. And it benefits the United States and Colombian justice systems. And uh, in the end, the extradition process itself relies on decisions by two sovereign nations. And we respect that. And that is exactly how we will continue to proceed. We always uh, when appropriate, we will seek extradition and countries will make their decisions and we will proceed forward. With respect to the issue of uh, the FARC and the designation of terrorism, uh, it's just entirely premature and possible to even begin to answer that question and inappropriate to deal with that question because there is no peace, because nothing has yet happened to make that uh, a relevant question to this moment of time. So uh, for the moment, uh, there is no process. We're not thinking about it. If and when peace is achieved and there's a reason to take stock, we will appropriately take stock, as we always do. But this is not the moment, and I have nothing to say with respect to uh, that particular designation, except that it stands as it is. Well, not here,